Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Kiak, and today we commemorate the, and celebrate the birth of, of St. John the Foreigner and the Baptist of our Lord. His birth, a lot like his life, was very miraculous, and it was foretold by centuries beforehand by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah said, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. St. John is unique in all of history, um, being chosen by God to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And his task was to prepare the way for Christ and his kingdom, to call people to repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And this is the same message that our Lord Jesus Christ preaches in the Gospels. Christ wants to lead people to a new place, to guide them away from despair, to lead them to hope, out of darkness, into light, far from fear, into his secure, eternal love, his embrace. And this type of change begins with one word, repent. And today when we remember this great forerunner and this great prophet of God, John the Baptist, we remember his words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These are also the first words our Lord used when he began his public ministry, repent. Repent basically means to change, to turn around, new direction, take new direction. It implies this reorienting of our lives away from our self-centered, egocentric ways that can lead to darkness and despair, and instead, turn towards the kingdom of heaven. Turn towards the presence of God. Repentance doesn't simply mean to feel sorry for some mistake or some failure for some sin. Instead, it calls for a conscious, and I would say courageous, change of life. A transformation into a new way of being not feeling sorry. That's the first step. And our society that we live in doesn't like to hear this word, doesn't like to talk about repentance too much. You don't hear it often. We don't like to be told we did something wrong. We don't like to be told that our actions or our words were actually sinful. How often do you hear in our society these like self-help people, these coaches, these life coaches, talk about the fundamental need to repent, to change. Repentance is not pleasant. And actually, true repentance is quite painful. It is the burning away of our sinfulness and our passions through the exposure of the light of Christ. And as we repent and seek after God, sometimes we encounter a lot of pain. Sometimes we encounter tribulation because our sin clings so closely to us. And as we try to push them away, try to push away our sins, we feel sometimes despair. We feel like, I can never do it. I'll never be able to separate myself from my sin. And that this sin is always going to cause me to be separated from our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a trick of the devil. Repentance begins in private. It begins with our closed door in prayer, our daily prayer. And it continues in the life of the church. It continues when we confess our sins before a priest who stands on behalf of Christ. Confession isn't easy. It's not convenient, but it's necessary. It's not optional. It's not something only for the youth. And as we get to a certain milestone in life, I'm good. I don't necessarily have to check in with, with the Buddha. It's necessary. Confession is necessary for our spiritual growth. And so we must repent and confess 
because we are in the middle of a war for our souls. And this war rages on every single day through the temptations and trials that are brought to us. Sometimes it feels like our trials and temptations are normal and they can feel constant and never ending. So what's our response? It's this constant prayer. It's this daily repentance. Many of the fathers speak of the Jesus prayer as one of the cornerstones of this constant prayer and repentance, this piece of it. We say, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It is this constant prayer and this reminder of our daily repentance. Forgive me, have mercy upon me, a sinner. There is power in the name of our Lord. And through his name, we begin to soften this hard and rocky soil of our hearts. And we make it possible for God to refashion this clay that's being formed and to mold our souls into something beautiful, something that is pleasing to him. It becomes a masterpiece, something truly in his image and his likeness. Now, at the start of the new year, we are given this opportunity to reflect and perhaps making some resolutions. And this is the beauty of the Coptic Church. And one of the things for me is that the, the church in the liturgical cycle, we always have these moments of pause and reflection. Sometimes it's the beginning of the Great Fast. Sometimes it's the beginning of the New Year, the Coptic Year, all these kind of things. We have moments of pause and reflection. We have a chance to aim higher and to desire higher, to want more for ourselves and for those who are around us. You know what a saint is? A saint is someone who allows his heart or her heart to become a safe place for Christ. That's a saint. A place where our Lord Jesus Christ is free to grow. A place where our Lord Jesus Christ is free to teach us openly without any restraint. That's a saint. A place where our Lord can mature fully and flourish. A place where our Lord can call home. That's the heart of a saint. When we struggle for this as our sole purpose in life, we find it is not Christ who finds a refuge in our hearts, but we find refuge in him. How do we give Christ a place to grow in our hearts? First, I think we have to treat our Lord as if he's precious. We don't take him for granted. We sanctify time. We sanctify space. We sanctify our senses. We don't just think of our bodies as temples. I, I pray that we think of our bodies as temples, a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says. I pray that, that we can consider our bodies a temple. But more than that, we think of our minds, our homes, our schedules as temples dedicated to our Lord. It means that our whole lives become temples dedicated to God. Now, the new year is on us. I have no doubt that we have resolutions that we're planning to make around the dinner table, perhaps. <clears throat> I think that if we choose to make a decision to make Christ precious in our lives, we will begin to be on the right track. But having a goal is not enough. The process is equally important. How do we get to our goal? How do we achieve our goal? The reality is that creating a place for Christ to grow in our hearts is very difficult. The Lord says, <clears throat> in, the Lord says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. 
because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. In other words, the orthodox way is a narrow way. It's a way of pure worship. It's a way of prayer. It's a way of fasting. It's a way of confession. It's a way of the Eucharist. It's a way of the saints. We don't come here to choose a nice church. We come here to choose a way of life. A choose a way of life for ourselves and for our kids and for our families. It's a way of life. By choosing to enter through this narrow way, you show God your commitment to make him precious. The life of an Orthodox Christian is not simply going through the motions on Sunday morning. It is the energized and joyful act of sanctifying your time and your space and your senses each and every day. Orthodoxy is the act of joyfully offering our lives to worship the living God. This is how we make God precious in our lives. This is how we protect and we guard our Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. The Lord tells us that no man can serve two masters. If we nurture our sinful desires or our false idols in our lives, power and comfort and money and control, we will be feeding and strengthening the enemy of Christ. And they will chase him out of our hearts and out of our lives. At times, we're pulled down by the great weight of our own sin. And sometimes they weigh heavy on us. They are heavy. Maybe when we're kids, we don't experience this, but as we grow and we mature, we gain to understand that this, this weight of sin becomes clear to us. Sometimes this manifests itself as a lack of peace in our lives. Sometimes people try to find various ways to numb the pain of their sin. And they try to numb the weight of this, this pressure from sin that is placed on our souls. Some people turn to a substance for escape. Others turn to attention, affection or praise, physical comforts. And sadly, Christians will even go in search of something like new age spiritualities in hopes that this might relieve the pain and will give them a new meaning in life. Sometimes people will give, go even further than that. They will claim, this is a point for our society, they will, they will claim that the ideas of guilt and shame and sin are this ingrained notion that's planted in our hearts from the Christian church and an, a Christian upbringing, and they pretend that none of these things are even real. You shouldn't feel guilt. You shouldn't feel shame over sin. Instead of grasping the reality that they try to escape through a life of perhaps rebellion and constantly drifting further and further away from Christ and the truth. All of this because we refuse to acknowledge the destructive, destructive power of sin in our own lives. We are sick. I know I am. We're, we're sick, and we come to the church, the hospital, sometimes with bodily sicknesses, sometimes with spiritual sicknesses. And we are likely to fall into despair as we try to climb out of the pit of our sins and our addictions and our habits. And we find ourselves figuratively covered in filth. Regardless of where we are, God is watching. He sees us. He understands our needs far better than we could even imagine or comprehend. The whole life of the Orthodox Christian is to struggle, is to prepare the way of the Lord, 
to chase out the money changers of the temple of our hearts and to dedicate the temples of our hearts to God. And for this reason, we keep vigils. We pray to the we pray past the point of comfort. We fast. We do prostrations. We do matanyas. We read the Psalms. We confess our sins. We receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all this is done to nourish Christ within our hearts. And while doing so, we wage battle against his enemies, laying them siege and forcing them into submission or even retreat. To conclude, St. John the Baptist is a reminder that we won't be transformed by following business as usual. We need a radical change. We need a spiritual rebirth, a new dependence on an openness to the power of God who does not operate according to our preferences and agendas. Instead of coming up with the usual excuses as to why we can't believe or live as Christ taught, it's time to be shaken out of the status quo. It's time to recognize that what has brought us weaknesses and despair and sorrow will simply continue to give us more of the same. A little bit of convenient religion on the margins of our lives may produce socially respectable people, but none of those things will manifest the heavenly kingdom even in this corrupt world. As St. John called the people to repentance so they can receive the Savior, he is also calling each one of us to repentance so that our hearts may be cleansed and may become more suitable dwelling places for our Savior. One of the Eastern Fathers says, to repent is not looking downward at my own shortcomings, but upward at God's love. Not backward with self-reproach, but forward with truthfulness. It is to see not what I have failed to be, but what by the grace of God I can yet become. The fruit of repentance is to see myself, to see you and all creation as God sees us. We ask for the intercession of St. John to help us through the struggle. May our Lord Jesus Christ renew our hearts and allow us to become a strong fortress for his son. And may the miraculous and powerful life of St. John the Baptist inspire us to prepare our hearts for the Lord. Let us repent and glory be to God forever. Amen. We exalt you.